This is the South African Karoo, harsh, arid country, where it takes five acres of grazing to sustain one sheep. So a farmer seldom builds his house within sight of his neighbor's chimney smoke. This is the story of one of these men. The Kingwills have been here on Gordonville for four generations. Rowley Kingwill was born here of 1820 settler stock. His wife Moira was born in Hrafrenet. Rowley is 80 years old and has long since handed over the farms to his two sons. He says he prefers deeds to words, but he has had pioneering ideas, often at first derided by his friends. But they have stood the test of time, and in this remote area of the country, he has found answers to some of the problems that trouble this nation, answers which have reached out far beyond his imagining. I believe we live amid three great crises. First, soil erosion, which can make our country a desert. Second, human relations and race conflict. Third, unemployment aggravated by the recession. We all want the government to provide the answers. But over the years, I have found how much the ordinary man can do. Take the question of soil erosion. Our little spring, which seeps slowly from the ground, is the lifeline of our farm. Grass on the uplands holds the rainwater so that it seeps into the earth and emerges as this little fountain. If the grass is destroyed, the water rushes away and the spring dies. And if the little spring dies, the farm dies. I think if I'd gone on farming the way I had been farming, it would have died long ago. Rowley had a big bond on his farm. Wool was their main source of income and wool prices were good. Like all the farmers, he was putting every sheep on the land that he could, but the felt was suffering. He often worried about the obvious scars caused by soil erosion. Dongas and sheet erosion were increasing through overgrazing, not only on their farm, but in all areas of the Karoo. The felt cover was being destroyed, and he realized that if this was not checked, South Africa could become a desert. I called myself a Christian, the way many of us do. But some friends visited us on the farm, and I was confronted with a wholly new thought. God has a plan. You have a part. I began to think, could this be possible for our country, for our farm, for our family? There began to grow in me what I call the new land ethic that the soil belongs to God and to future generations. But I was exploiting it for my own gain. And I began to glimpse a further truth. When man listens, God speaks. Rowley was then about the age his son Robert is now. I sat before the fire one night, wondering if this could be true. Could God actually put a thought into the mind of a man? I had always wanted to be master of the situation. Was I willing to put my life under God's direction, not knowing where it would lead? I remember vividly sitting with my elbows on my knees in front of the fire. And I said, God, if you can speak, Speak to me now. Immediately, and to my astonishment, a fully formed thought came into my mind. You must get going. I have work for you. This was completely foreign to Rowley's way of thinking. How could God have worked for a shy, deeply reserved young farmer, slow of thought, slow of speech, in the wide, open spaces of the Karoo? Yet I knew without a shadow of a doubt that God had spoken to me and that I needed to decide. This was a step into the unknown, so he took time each morning to try and find out what this work could be. I thought again about the farm and the deterioration of my own land and the land all around. I wrote down the thought 
the place to start is on your own farm and with yourself. Reduce your stock by one third, introduce a system of rotational grazing. This was asking an awful lot. It went against all my economic planning, but I was committed to a new kind of Christianity, the Christianity of obedience. So I did it. I sold one third of my stock, cut down our income by one third. The years which followed were difficult. We had to economize in every way. We cut out every sort of luxury. It took years, but gradually the grass began to grow where there had been no grass before. Slowly, the sheep began to produce more wool per head and the lambing percentage increased. Our values began to change. Now, our wealth was not in our bank account, which was meager and mostly overdrawn anyway, but in the health of our livestock and in the density of our felt cover. The grass was growing where only shrubs grew before. Cattle were fattening where there had been no food 10 years before. Today in our hearts is a joy and pride that this piece of land is flowering under the love we have learned to give it. Today these ideas are commonplace. Scientists and extension officers recommend stock reduction and a variety of felt management systems. But when Rowley first took this step in faith and obedience, little was known and nothing had been proved in this vital matter. He began to feel responsible for the nation. He joined the farmers' associations and spoke about the lessons he was learning. He was elected to the Soil Conservation Committee and so extended his battle to save the soil. However, 400 million tons of our topsoil are still being washed down our rivers every year. But we can win this battle, and we must win this battle if we are going to preserve this lovely land. South Africa is best known around the world for its racial tensions, and even remote areas like Krafrenet are not immune. This issue has been of supreme concern to Rowley over the years. Our greatest crisis is in human relations. Schools are being burnt, people are being killed, black and white seem to have lost touch with each other. I am deeply conscious that I'm part of an unjust structure of white privilege. This has got to change. It will change. But even a new structure without new human relationships will not work. Certainly my attitudes were part of the problem. I expected the workers to be at the crawl gate at sunrise, ready for work. I gave the orders. They had to obey. No arguments. Early one morning, a basic change was set in motion on the farm. Rowley wrote down the thought, apologize to your neighbor for your feud. Apologize to your staff for the rows you've had with them. To apologize to my neighbor was one thing, but to apologize to my staff was quite another. This I felt was really going too far. I hesitated, I argued, I delayed, but the thought kept coming back and I was committed to obedience. He met the men at the kraal gate as usual, only this time he apologized for when he had lost his temper with them. He had all sorts of fears. Would discipline break down? Would they laugh at him? But instead, there seemed to be an immediate understanding. The apology cut at the root of his white arrogance. His dictatorial ways had been stifling initiative. Now, unsuspected creativity appeared as they began to plan together. <laughs> My color categories had put a ceiling on people. Now each individual became important. How they lived, we looked into that. We began to improve their housing. We began to think about the children. 
There were no schools in the area. Children just roamed around or played in the sand. One day, one of the maids asked if she could gather the children and teach them to read and write. She had only passed standard two herself, but soon the children were learning eagerly. The King Wills put an outside room at her disposal, convinced that this was the beginning of something important. They bought slates and books. Then they took the next step. They built a schoolroom and hired a qualified teacher. Her salary they paid out of their own pockets. A school on the farm? Never. Some of the neighbors laughed at them. Others complained that if the workers were educated, they would demand more money. But the school went ahead. At the 1954 Congress of the Agricultural Union, Rowley made a plea for schools to become part of farm policy. Newspapers supported him with front page headlines. Today, farm schools are subsidized and teachers are paid by the government. Now, Rowley's daughter-in-law, Jeanette, teaches the farm's 12 children spanning five standards. Getting competent teachers here where we are is not easy, as many of them prefer town or city life. So though I'm really a trained personnel psychologist, I have been involved with our school since 1974. My dog's name is them. I took him to the bathroom and told him how to swim, but he drank up all the water and ate up all the soap, so he was very sick in bed with bubbles in his room. One morning I wrote down the thought, give your staff a sense of security. I had kept the right to instant dismissal. I called the men together and I said to them, no one of you who wants to work and carry your weight will be dismissed, even if times get hard. I also said to them, your homes are yours as long as you want to stay. Soon, flowers and vegetables began to grow, but we still had the problem of weekend drinking and Monday absenteeism. One young man in particular was a problem. He was always in a fight and generally disruptive. Since I had apologized to my staff, my whole attitude had changed. Now, I did not see him as a man to be disciplined or dismissed, but as a fellow human being in need of help. The first year of our life was very happy. Then drink got hold on me. We wish to quarrel every weekend, I and my wife. Then Mr. Kingwell and Mrs. Kingwell talk, talk with us. One day I read the Bible. I see in the Bible, in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is known you? So I and Mr. Kingwell pray together. I decided not to drink anymore. Since then, our life was a better life and a happy home. The pattern of weekends has changed. Douglas and others often take Sunday service down in the woolshed. Looking back now, I realize how much pride and convention had walled me off from other races. The day I apologized in the crawl was the beginning of a new era. Our lives have become enriched. Moira is one of the few whites in the area entitled to wear the uniform of the Mother's Union of one of the black churches. And Rowley, believe it or not, has been made an honorary member of the National Council of African Women. The farm workers and their families started a Gordonville soccer team and an inter-farm competition. They've only been beaten once in five years. Oh, 
Word of the relationships built up with the workers over the years has spread far beyond the borders of the farm. Remote as the King Wills are, many great African leaders have visited their farm. Salopi Tema, early editor on the black newspaper The World. Philip Wundler, militant leader from Soweto. Dr. William Nkomo, a founder and first president of the African National Congress Youth League. He and Rowley traveled together in Zambia, Zaire, Burundi, seeking together already years ago that elusive goal of peace, unity, and justice for all. Every family has its traumas, and the Kingwills are no exception. One bitter blow concerned their son, Robert. When he was 10 months old, he got very ill. After he recovered, we discovered that he was deaf. This, of course, was shattering. In quiet one morning, I wrote down a thought. Do not give your son the added handicap of bitter parents. This thought gave us direction. I started off by making books with pictures of the family so that Robert could learn to know the names of his immediate family and neighbors and friends. And from there, we went on to various picture stories. I even had to teach him the names of the colors and well, everything from scratch. He went through Union High School in Krafrenet like any other boy. He was an outstanding athlete and became the Victor Lodorum. He also seems to have a special way with animals. The third great crisis in our country is unemployment, now aggravated by recession. People are being laid off everywhere. We kept asking ourselves what we could do to help the situation. Their son David has taken over Gordonville and shares his father's philosophy of putting people before profits. When there is a drought, we farmers have a very hard time. It is then that the bankers and the economists tell us that the solution is to see what the minimum number of staff that a farm can run with and to fire the rest. Well, neither myself nor my father think that that is right. We feel that the right place to start is with the needs of the people. And one of the major needs is for work, for the opportunity for work. And we see, try to see rather, instead of how few we can run the farm with, as to how many we can support on the farm. It is not easy on the pocket, but the result is a secure and happy staff and you know, we have people here that have been on this farm up to the fourth generation. Robert's wife, Philida, has set about creating employment for the women. One day in New Bethesda, I saw 200 black school children marching. I looked at their faces and I asked myself, what are they going to do when they leave school? Black rural women have no status and they have no way of getting it. I decided that day that I was going to train the women on the farm and in the village to do leather work and sheepskin work. I knew nothing about leather work or sheepskin work, so I had to learn, and we learned together. We experimented on patterns, and if they worked and they, they sold, we mass produced. In the summertime, we make sandals and belts and purses, and in the wintertime, we make sheepskin slippers, boots, hats, gloves, and the women use inexpensive tools which they can take home and use on a cottage industry basis. Daughter-in-law Jeanette, in addition to teaching, has started a spinning and weaving industry.
We experimented with natural dyes and used the karoo bush, which gave us these yellow, gold, greeny colors. We also used the fruit of the red cactus, and that gives this interesting range of colors here. Then we established a small flock of black sheep, which we use for the very highly prized dark fleeces. And we find the women really value and take great pride in their work and the extra income it brings to their families. Here in Hrafrenet, the Kingwills took the operation a step further. This historic 200-year-old town, 80 kilometers from Gordonville, is the hub of the Eastern Cape farming community. Much of it has been declared a national monument and is being restored to its original simple architecture. Four years ago, Rowley and Moira, with a few others, set up a non-profit knitting and weaving project in the town. Many of these workers come from a background of poverty and despair. One was 16 and had only passed standard two. She had a baby, and suffered from malnutrition. Today, she is a skilled spinner. Another was trying to feed her family on 10 rand a month. A third had been forced to leave school to feed a family of eight. A fourth was in the hands of moneylenders who came and tried to get her away from her weaving. Because of our conviction, and in the face of poverty, which we have all around us in our townships, Rowley and I uh, felt that we should do something about it. And so we started this project of spinning using the product of the district and we started in a small way with two spinning wheels we started in the back of the beer hall in our african township and gradually we increased our wheels and brought in looms four years ago in our location there were many unemployed people and so Mr. Kingwell and his friends decided to help us. He opened a spinning and weaving uh, uh, business. And there I was, I, I've been with them from 81 till now. And now here I'm doing weaving. I'm, I'm proud of weaving. First of all, I was a spinner and now I'm a weaver. I'm proud of weaving because I feel that I must use my talent that God gave me. Moira and I work unpaid. For the first two years, we came in for four days each week. Now we have 30 people employed and a manageress who works for a fraction of what she could earn elsewhere. But her satisfaction and ours is to see how people grow in dignity when they have a job and when they have a skill. These creations from the wool of merino sheep and angora goats have attracted attention overseas. Garments hand-knitted by people who, a year or two ago, saw no hope or purpose in life. Today, Rowley looks back over the many years since that first startling experience changed him from a skeptic to a believer, to his first hesitant steps to apologize to his neighbor, to build new human relationships on the farm, to care for the soil, to live to answer human need. He is now more convinced than ever that the ordinary man does have a part to play in answering the needs of the nation. We have made mistakes. We have had our ups and downs. But I did decide to lay down my right to my life to do what I want, where I want, how I want. We did not find ease or comfort or prosperity. 
but we did find purpose, a deep joy, a great hope. And we've proved that when man listens, God speaks, and when man obeys, God acts. Here, I think, is the missing factor in our country. Not white domination, not black domination, but black and white together, listening to the Father of us all and walking shoulder to shoulder as the sons and daughters of God towards a great future for us all. Thank you.